To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Officially, there are three branches of government, the president, Congress, and the Supreme Court. But some people like to say there's a fourth branch, the media. That's me, that's where I work. Independent journalism is a vital part of any functioning democracy. The public needs to stay informed if they want to have a say in how the government works. And the media is supposed to hold the government accountable and call them out when things get a bit too watergate -y. And I mean that literally. The Washington Post, where I used to work and scavenge for leftovers in the office kitchens, famously covered the Watergate scandal in 1972. That's when President Nixon's campaign was behind political crimes, including a burglary, at the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. But unlike political journalists, you probably don't get paid to pay attention to politicians 24-7. So the media keeps an eye on Washington and sounds the alarm when the rest of us should start paying attention. But things get complicated when we consider how they report this news. Sure, a little bit of flair keeps things interesting, but the way the media delivers news influences public opinion, giving them the power to inform, politicize, or anything in between. Hi, I'm Chris Vasquez, reporting from Study Hall Headquarters. This is Power and Politics in US Government. When media outlets like major newspapers and TV shows report the news, they engage in something called agenda setting, where they get to choose which issues deserve public discussion and should be considered important. Because like we all learned in middle school, if no one's talking about something, how important can it really be? The classic quote about agenda setting theory is that the press may not be successful much of the time in telling people what to think, but it is stunningly successful in telling its readers what to think about. An example would be how you've probably heard something about Supreme Court cases like Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization from 2022, which struck down Roe versus Wade, making abortion access a state issue. But unless you're a big time government podcast nerd, you probably haven't heard of cases like Torres versus Texas Department of Public Safety from the same year, where a disabled war veteran won against a state employer that had refused to give him reasonable accommodations. And that's because many large media organizations didn't deem it salient or important enough to really report on. As part of carefully choosing what information to highlight within the larger media ecosystem, journalists can use their platform to do important work, like muckraking. Muckraking is a kind of reporting where journalists research and publish investigative reports that expose corruption, as well as scandalous information on high-profile people or businesses, like when the Daily Bugle learned that the X-Men could come back from the dead. You might have heard of muckraking as a negative thing, but it depends on the context and whether the dirt they dig up is relevant to a real story or just clickbait. It's sort of similar to whistleblowing, where workers report the wrongdoings of their employer in order to protect public interests. Sometimes, muckraking journalists even work with government whistleblowers to inform their investigative journalism. One famous example comes from Upton Sinclair's 1906 book, The Jungle, which described an immigrant's brutal experiences working in Chicago's meatpacking industry. While Sinclair exposed corruption and the exploitation of workers, coverage often still focuses on the disgusting, unsanitary conditions he detailed within the factories. In fact, the book helped lead to the creation of the Meat Inspection Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and the entire Food and Drug Administration. Muckraking can be a powerful way to shine light on sketchy policies, but there are also more subtle ways that reporting can influence our thinking, like priming, which happens when media coverage activates our underlying thoughts. With priming, the more a topic is talked about in the news, the more accessible these areas become in our minds, influencing our political thinking. If a news channel consistently reports unemployment stats, jobs moving overseas, or inflation, then their audience is predisposed to perceive the economy as weak. If a pollster then asks us how we feel about the president's performance, the economy will weigh more heavily on our minds than a different, less discussed topic like foreign policy then we'd be more likely to rate the president poorly because we're preoccupied with the struggling economy. Issues that can be primed are given more weight in an unconscious way, so these topics have a bigger impact on our overall evaluations. Another way media outlets can predispose their audience to thinking certain thoughts is through framing. This is when the news strategically chooses the way information is presented, and it can impact the way that a story or event is perceived by the audience. There are a few different forms of framing. With episodic framing, reporting shares the story of a specific person, and it usually focuses on a specific event. Like in a new story about how AI is driving unemployment in creative industries, they could focus on an unemployed writer's experience navigating government benefits while also trying to find a new job. But with thematic framing, the focus is on the bigger picture of the issue at hand. So here, the story would focus on sharing national unemployment statistics over time, and even linking whether rates have gone up and down to changes in policies or leadership. These different frames impact who viewers think is responsible for fixing problems, and how they assign the blame when things go wrong. Depending on the news source and what questions the journalist chooses to ask, a piece with episodic framing could make an audience think that it's the individual's fault they're unemployed, which can make it so we ignore the higher level, systematic reasons why someone might be unemployed. Thematic framing, on the other hand, could be used to talk about long-term unemployment trends in their industry, or to compare starting salaries with the costs of childcare. 
and that can show how a person's unemployment is a reflection of problems in the broader system. There's also racial framing, which says that the way outlets talk about race can influence how audiences perceive especially marginalized racial groups. Racial framing can be seen in the coverage of demonstrations after police officer Darren Wilson shot and killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. In covering Black Lives Matter demonstrations, some news outlets framed them as riots, highlighting looting and violent behavior. Others frame the events as protests, stressing the virtuous fight against police violence and systemic racism. But since most journalists are white, one consequence is that mainstream media sources tend to tell stories from white people's perspectives. The white experience is the one that gets centered in storytelling, and only those put into other racial categories end up getting stereotyped based on race. When whiteness is invisible like that, it can lead to people not really understanding the perspectives or histories of people in the minority, who often have less social and political power. And that allows false narratives and stereotyping to take hold. So it's worth paying attention not just to the story itself, but how that story is being told. Because priming and framing can be used to strategically reinforce biases in the audience. And that leads us to a broader discussion on the politicization and influence of the news in our increasingly online society, which has changed a lot over time. Imagine it's 1953, and you're watching the news on your cereal box size black and white TV screen. After World War II, you had radio stations, the rise of television networks, and the major newspapers, and they pretty much had the power to set the national news agenda. And what might surprise our non-boomer viewers is that because of the 1949 Fairness Doctrine, outlets had to give time to both sides of controversial issues. But for decades, some conservative radio outlets were frustrated by the Fairness Doctrine, because when they shared conservative talking points on air, they were forced by the courts to give time to the liberal perspective too. In 1969, a Pennsylvania broadcaster took part of the Fairness Doctrine all the way to the Supreme Court. But in that case, the court ruled that the Fairness Doctrine didn't violate the freedom of speech. Since the radio spectrum could only have so many stations, it wasn't possible for everyone to have a voice. So the court found that the Fairness Doctrine actually strengthened free speech by allowing for diverse and balanced arguments to play out on air. The Fairness Doctrine lasted until the 1980s, when Reagan and the Federal Communications Commission finally stopped enforcing it, saying that changes in technology made it so the number of channels weren't so limited anymore. Because of the doctrine, many stations were just shying away from issues rather than covering both sides, making some people think it was better to let free speech happen unfettered. Overnight, there was a huge boom in conservative radio shows that often pushed racist talking points, like Rush Limbaugh, who enthusiastically spread anti-immigrant rhetoric and by 1994 had millions of listeners. Hosts like Limbaugh and their massive platforms made the issues they discussed more salient to their audience. By dehumanizing people of color, these hosts used racial framing to influence how their listeners perceive topics like immigration or racial injustice. These days, we have instantaneous access to any and all news stories through our phones and computers. This new level of accessibility expands our exposure to news, so it can play a bigger role in our lives. But despite this endless access to information, our news exposure also tends to be more selective than before. 30 years ago, everyone used to watch the same evening news. But now, people seek out their preferred news programs, like MSNBC or Fox News, or rely on social media sites like Facebook and the platform formerly known as Twitter, where they follow people with similar viewpoints to their own. In another episode, we'll go into deeper detail about the challenges or benefits of having social media as a dominant news source. But for now, we can acknowledge that these outlets all report the news in different ways, so there's not a lot of uniformity when it comes to what people are hearing or reading. That makes it even more important to be aware of the way the news can be politicized, which is the process of making something non-political, political. When consuming news, it's good to stay aware of potential biases in reporting, and to fact-check blanket statements that you hear. It's always a safe bet to get news from multiple sources, so that you're hearing more than just a singular take on something. Independent news is a cornerstone of democracy, but we've seen fair reporting continue to shift in recent decades due to the goal of growing an audience at any cost. And after all, if politicized reporting gets your company more clicks, then why wouldn't you lean into a controversial discussion? I mean, even the titular citizens that Citizen Kane was based on understood that. But when it comes to money and power in the media, we see an unsettling amount of it concentrated in just a few massive corporations, like Disney, Comcast, Warner Brothers, and Viacom CBS. With these literal monopolies largely controlling the media, we get to hear fewer and fewer voices with independent, local, and nuanced takes, at least from mainstream sources. And as of 2023, about three quarters of citizens agree that holding the government and politicians accountable is a vital responsibility of the press. So it wouldn't be great if this unofficial fourth branch of the government was controlled by, say, White Claw. The draw of big profits might make news outlets more likely to exaggerate and politicize their reporting. And that takes away from the supposed independent, fair coverage that is so vital for us to stay informed. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Power and Politics in US Government, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.